So I uh, would love to invite in a resignation for all of those Hello workers and the Hello world and Gil Headley, my guest today. Uh, I'm gonna bring in the high five that I learned in school of tuning into the physical, mental, emotional, energetic, spiritual. Uh, so I'd just love everybody just to take a few breaths, tune in. Well, welcome, Gil. Thank you so much for being with us today. I, My pleasure. Uh, I wish I had uh, thought to invite people to this meeting, but I did collect some questions from Great. the community. So <laughs> I would bring those in so you'll get a variety of curiosities coming your way. Great. Uh, and I thought I would start with one of my own. Um, I thought it would be fun because I've seen you take a lot of photos and see almost like the inner beauty and anatomy of photos. So I found these uh, pictures that really spoke to me of a Brazilian meditation gathering where they put incense in the middle. I don't know if you've seen them, but they yeah. resonated on a word and these images popped up. So I just thought it'd be fun with your anatomical lens, if you could tell me what you see, if you'd wow. be up to that. Of course, sure, let's, uh, <laughs> let's give it a shot. Okay, there we go, there's number one. Wow, my goodness. Looks like a head to me, it looks like the head, like, but balanced uh -uh. and like uh, like the mouth is open and it's like <laughs> the emanation of the voice, you know, um, coming out of the, out of the throat. I can see and that. All the magic, all the magic of a, of a, of an utterance like the word being spoken. It's very beautiful. Yeah, I tried. I think I found the the words for everything, but I couldn't really find what this word was. It was something like portail solar air. I was trying to find it right before. So I'll, mm. if I find it, I'll I'll let you know. Yeah, that's neat. Here's here's the next one. Whoa. Wow. Oh my gosh. There's so much going on there. So I see like, um, like a little person in the middle with their, with their feet, the little blue feet at the bottom, like little curvy elf feet and yeah. their arm and their arms and hands kind of curling up, uh, above that with their feet, their legs very close together, standing there like uh like here i am and then they're kind of rooting into the ground and and uh and and sky earth a little earth and sky rooting there or i see a giant pendulous penis those are my options <laughs> uh, i saw the penis first and then i saw the little person there and i think it's a giant person penis yeah well <laughs> the the word is intuition ah so that, that I I like I like that I also see some with the elf person I see some wings. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, wings, <laughs> wings. Uh huh. All right, that last awesome. last one. What do we got here? Huh? Well, there's a uterus in the middle. I see. There's that sort of in in the center of the image is a there's kind of a bright aspect 
And then it has like two kind of straight up or off to the right and left, uh, like elongations and then the ovaries, right? So you got your fallopian tubes and your, and your ovaries coming down to the fundus of the uterus. And then, uh, and then it's all positioned over, over a vertebrae. Mm -hmm. You see that that's the, um, the atlas there. Yeah. <laughs> at, almost. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like on, on top of the atlas, there's like a fog of like a brain to me. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. What beautiful images. And this image, uh, they were focusing on the word light. On the word light. All right. Well, the light is, uh, is uh, streaming into and out of the top of the head there. <laughs> that's how yeah. it looks to me. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, that I, thought that'd be, I thought that'd be a fun icebreaker. Very creative. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah, that's great. A little Rorschach. Uh, well, that's wonderful. It's more fun than ink blots. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll dig into some of my colleagues' questions and I'll kind of circulate through them so I can hopefully get one from, from everyone. Uh, but Carrie would like to know, uh, in regard to body's response to high stress and PTSD and its effect on fascia, uh, and she was talking about in the early days of COVID, um, there was a, a certain anxiety and she noticed something interesting with her long-term clients that they were there, that it was even softer almost like they were on coracoid steroids or something of that nature. And so I think her question was, uh, what do you think the effects of possibly like anxiety or COVID might be on the fascia if you had any thoughts? I think that's a brilliant observation on whose part, Carrie? Carrie. Um, that's so interesting uh, what she was feeling there because my gosh, I'm yanking my own earphones out here. Because the rights, we're talking about a stress response and the corticosteroids are right being produced by your adrenal glands and showering into your body in preparation for injury repair. That's kind of what they're about. It's like, oh, I'm about to be devoured, which means I'm going to have <laughs> holes in me and tears. And so the body is already flooding, you know, the, the tissues with the, with, um, the capacity to break down the injured tissues, right? And, and start the repair process. So there's a, like a, maybe a, yeah, there's gonna be a, it's gonna start eating them up, softening things up. Um, <laughs> that's terrifying. <laughs> I'm horrified, <laughs> but I guess that's what we do, huh? We run around expecting in our, in our culture today, I mean, maybe when we were hunter gatherers, it's like, yeah, every every couple of days or weeks, maybe you'd see something out on the plains and you'd be like, oh, damn, that thing could eat me. And, and you'd have that kind of rush. But now all you got to do is r read anything you're being told or <laughs> listen to anything. And it's like the it's like the tell the hunt is coming over the over the hill every second of the day forever. And and so. I mean, we, I think we really have to learn to tune it out uh, because we have so many kind of false signals of danger in our environment or real signals, they're real sig signals of danger, but not ones that are actually meaningfully endangering us in the moment that our own hormonal cascades are being triggered. Um, wow, <laughs> I'm shaking in my boots. <laughs> I like to I like to do what my dogs do, and in the great words of Taylor Swift, "Shake it off." Yeah, <laughs> something that happens to like shake their whole bodies and like, shake it off. It <laughs> shake it off. Turn it off. Don't buy yeah. it. These are phrases that are really useful. Yeah, it's a, it's it's an interesting uh, period of time of body work mm. with COVID. 
uh, yeah. because it's so widespread. And I'm sure it was hard for a lot of people to turn it off. Yeah, yeah, it is. And yet, and yet we gotta, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's for a minute, because otherwise we're literally breaking our tissues down on the go. And the danger, our, our perception of danger is often overwrought. I'm not just talking about COVID, I'm just talking in general. That's just the nature of our social world right now. Um, but if you really like, like kind of like come into the present moment and out of the fear, it's like, am I actually in danger? You know, mm -hmm. getting a good dose of perspective shift. Yeah. Like stepping out. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Okay. Um, this one comes from Veronica and I'm going to piggyback with one of mine. Cause I was curious, uh, but she, uh, she really likes how uh, there was an opening up of all these bodies are different, but in a lot of anatomy texts, you don't get to see a lot of the variations. And she, she wondered if you had any recommendations for getting an idea of like getting an anatomical view of these different body types. Wow. Yeah. So I love the question because it goes to one of the central tenets you know, or starting points, I should say, of integral anatomy, which is the individual, like because exactly what she's reminding us of that, that they're, the books are averages and means, right? And so they, they are um, not pointing actually to anybody to, or to any single body. Um, maybe the, the color atlases where they actually have a dissection on the table, but again, they're gonna choose one that in their minds most closely enables them to represent the drawings, mm -hmm. not the human body, right? So you go looking for a body that's actually not the body, you know, uh, and you cut it until it obeys the drawings because that's what you're trying to teach. And so I, well, I'm working on it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sh sharing, uh, you know, I mean, for I've had the experience of many, many bodies, hundreds of bodies now uh, that just adds to my absolute conviction in the impressive and beautiful uniqueness of each individual and and the uh, the fact that each person represents a perfect example of human anatomy, not because it matches a picture, but because it says, fuck you to the picture. <laughs> <laughs> That does it its own way, right? <laughs> and so that's what kind of what we have to do. And in in the case of body workers out there at large, uh, you know, structural integrators and color workers, you have the ultimate inside knowledge of these facts because you've got your hands on people, and and you you are holding the evidence of what I'm saying in your hands. So it's not far from you. And the question is whether we can manifest the humility to admit and stand before with some awe, this unique example of human anatomy that is perfect in its own right. And that has to be used to correct every other thing we know. Uh, so, so you, if you're like, this knobbly bit here, there's not something wrong with it. This is this person's manifestation in the physical. This is, this is a representation of the idea of human happening right here in, in front of you. You have your own self to compare it with in the, in, in the, in the immediate moment. And you can then look into that mirror and, and instead of seeing, you know, uh, a difference to be corrected, you can see, a, a unique and precious instantiation of what it means to be living out life in a human body and then work with what's in front of you and in your hands rather than what's in your head or what's in your, in, in your book or what's in your idealized version of where this one ought to go somewhere more towards what you think is perfect because it's already perfect as an instantiation of a set of personal compensations you know, in gravity to live a life. 
So then the question is, can you support that, you know, rather than fix it? Yeah, I like that, that mantra of going into a session and being like, I'm not fixing anything. <laughs> and then also like letting the client know, because a lot of people come to you and they're like, can you fix me? <laughs> they do. And we, and we go to them saying, I can fix you or I want to fix you or it's my dream to fix you. But what is, what is that? And, and of course, we want to be relieved of our suffering. People show up suffering. You want to relieve them. But I don't think that the relief of suffering is going to come through making them more like something that they're not. You know, it may be becoming more accepting. Uh, of what you are, not with a view to saying, I'm just going to live with this pain forever. But oftentimes our pain is resistance to who we are. And so, you know, it's if you show up saying, I agree, you shouldn't be who you are, you know, <laughs> and, and, and then the two of you are hacking away at that together. That's very, very different than saying, um, you know, who you are is okay. And then maybe I won't struggle against it so hard because a lot of our pain is struggling against our experiences rather than, than taking a ride and maybe even a joyful ride uh, that sometimes has bumps and sometimes you get tossed out of the boat and you bang your head on a rock, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which sucks, but you know, then rub your head and it doesn't have to be such a big deal. <laughs> Uh, I'm curious how, uh, how you practice maybe this mindset. Uh, I was curious, you were talking with, um, Aaron Alexander on a podcast, and hmm. this is kind of in league with what you were saying, where there was talk of, uh, boundaries and trying different things and challenging yourself. Hmm. Uh, so I was curious what you do to, kind of shift your perspective or challenge yourself in terms of like self-care or trying new things? Do you have a, do you have a practice of such? Does I don't know if sense? anyone, yeah, I don't know if anyone would call my life much of a practice, although I am constantly practicing every time I wake up in the morning. Uh, it's like, oh, well, I got to try this earth thing again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I, I mean, for instance, we moved, um, we keep moving, we've moved again. So it's like, can you just drop something or a way of being and join with somebody? I have a partner now the last three years and we've, we've, uh, we just keep stepping towards each other and, and, and daring to not do what we've been doing, you know, so I've in the last that's that's the thing it's like are you emily conrad was wonderful she always talked about ruts you know like movement ruts and neurological ruts created from from repetition of behaviors and uh maybe my practice is to is, is to um be willing to to change it up to to drop a certain way of doing things um and, uh, and, and be willing to be surprised that the way I had been doing it, that there's another way, you know, that I'm not, not so absolutely attached um, to how something's being done. That's why my classes could be a little chaotic because I know that even as I invite people to do something a certain way, I know that they're not going to, and I'm not gonna stop them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because I because there's a little part of me that's terrified about something being done a new or different way. And then there's a little part of me that's like, this is what I'm in it for, you know, is to is to witness what else can happen here. Um, right now, we're living on a mountainside in Colorado. And uh, and uh, it's like, wow, just walk in a new place. It's like <laughs> take a different path. Yeah, right on. <laughs> That's good advice. Um, okay, let's see. <laughs> I kind of want to go on these tangents of my own, but I want to make sure I bring in everybody. So I'm gonna. That's go your. Back to that's my your colleagues. privilege. That's your privilege. <laughs> you can like mysteriously forget a question and ask your own. Like, who's gonna know? No one's there. <laughs> that's true. That's true. 
this random person just asked. <laughs> um, well, here's a fun one. I have a, a, a rolfer in town I trade with. Uh, and when he was a rolfing student, he got invited to see you. And he wondered if you remembered when it was snowing and you were in your, it was a Boulder, Colorado lab and you fell or descended from the skylight. And then you talked about a muscle near the bus the bucinator that was unnamed. And he wondered if you remembered that because he has a very stark memory. And I'm still not sure if you fell from the skylight or descended in some way. So I'm also <laughs> curious if this memory is. I like do it. remember offering a class or two in Boulder. Uh, I I don't remember descending from a from a skylight, I wouldn't put it past me <laughs> to do that. So I won't deny it. And in terms of an unnamed muscle near the booksnator, the one thing I can remember from that period is my, my intense excitement uh, in dissecting the, the jaw and the muscles of mastication at the time, because I wasn't far from my rolfing career back, back way back then. This is, we're talking about probably over 20 years ago, um, this, this recollection on this person's part. And so I'm, I'm struggling here, but what I can remember is that there were a couple of articles in these dental journals that I had read uh, with some excitement as there is like literally every year about the new muscle that's never been spoken of or discovered. And it's a new one every year, and it's usually something that everybody knows and has dissected a million times. But no one, you know, in the public, they can get some some newspaper sales out of it. Back when they were newspapers, and this one was the fifth muscle of mastication, and and it was basically saying, "Well, we've caught the body in a new and unusual way, and have discovered this amazing new muscle." And what it was was something that I've been dissecting for years at that time even, which was kind of a, an aspect of the temporalis muscle. So we know the temporalis muscle is like this clamshell on the sides of your head, right? And then the, the flashcards say that it goes from there up on your skull and then, you know, uh, there, exactly. <laughs> and then proceeds down. Now put your finger on the coronoid process of the mandible. That's the, that's the condyle of the mandible. Now the other pointy bit, Forward, there you go. That's the coronoid process. So, so according to the flashcards, that's the insertion of the temporalis muscle. Now, so if you're dissecting from a book and you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna lift it off of the, the side of the skull there and gonna sneak underneath the, the zygomatic arch, right? Cause it goes underneath the, get your finger there. Yeah, there you go. It goes underneath the zygomatic arch to that coronoid process. So if I cut at the coronoid process, right? Then I think, okay, I've got the temporalis muscle, but no, right? Because it turns out that the tissue, go back to your coronoid process, right? Goes all the way down the inside of the angle of the mandible there. Go on the inside, all the way down. Yeah, get rid of those glasses. Go all the way down, 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 down in there. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> oh, you just, you just, Wow, I felt that. So right where your pointer <laughs> finger is now, right where your pointer finger, the temporalis goes all the way down to there. White, dense, fibrous matter, right? That, that runs there. It's very pretty silvery tissue. Uh, and it's, it's basically, um, I would, yeah. And so you're there and then it goes back up behind the eye socket. So from that jaw point, it goes not through the eye socket, but belt goes zygomatic arch. I right, get yeah. your finger, get your finger back in that zygomatic arch. There you go, right in there. Now squish it towards the eyeball. There you go. Tucked right in there is the sphenoid bone, right? And the, zygo and the zygoma, right? So those two bones actually have muscle tissue that comes from there down to the angle of the mandible where you were. And it's all part and parcel of the temporalis. And so they called that aspect of it the sphenomandibularis muscle, right? Because it's going from the sphenoid to the mandible, or some called it the zygomandibularis muscle. So I called it the sphenozygomandibularis muscle, <laughs> right? The SZM, 
instead of the SCM, the SZM, Sphenozygomandibularis. I was very excited about it. And I dissected it many, many times and tried to get pictures of it, including when I was there in that Boulder lab. So maybe that's what's remembering. But what excited me was because I did mouth work, right? As a rolfer, as, as yeah. I, I do the hell work, so you mouth work too? Yes, right? we do. Intra, intra oral work. So if you put your finger inside your mouth and follow your lower molars, right? To the yeah. back. And you think you're heading for the, for the medial pterygoid. Yeah. What you're really going to hit is that lower portion of the temporalis of the sphenozygomandibularis muscle. Before you gag, you'll hit the you'll hit the temporalis. And, and you, so everybody's working on the temporalis and they don't know it. They think they're working on the medial pterygoid a lot of the time. Now, there are people, of course, who, who know the difference, right? But yeah. I was excited because I didn't know the difference and I wanted to teach and share with everybody the, the difference between the, the medial pterygoid, which you access, right? Through the intraorally and the lower fibers, right? That are running along the mandible of the temporalis muscle. So there you go. That's what I remember about my descent from the skylight. Yeah, <laughs> I love that memory. It's educational. <laughs> yeah. Start, start playing around with intraoral and uh, having to move around and be have a hand on the temporalis. Yeah. I think that'll be fun. Yeah. Good spot. Um, Good spot. I'm kind of curious because I recently had dental work and I was thinking about this because uh, I know with anesthesia, it's different, but with local anesthetic and mm -hmm. numbing, uh, I feel like my tissues need to like remember to relax like they go through like this drilling trauma and I was oh, yeah. curious what your thoughts were on on that I've been to the dentist three times in my adult life since I was 17 so <laughs> <laughs> I I had you limited, like this, you limited your trauma <laughs> yeah exactly I have that's been my strategy for limited trauma I floss and uh and I <laughs> I, I had a cavity so big about six years ago that like my tooth was falling apart. So I went to, uh, the, I had my first kindly dental experience in my life. And, uh, and I was like, wow, I'd go to you again if I ever went to a dentist again. <laughs> so I do think that dental work can be very traumatic and that our, and that we will hold hold out you know uh, for years relative to those experiences although i don't think anything survives i i think i'm I gonna say i don't think anything surpasses the trauma that we do to ourselves in in our social constructs where we limit our speech that's the real trauma to the head mouth and throat uh, is is our is our um, constant censorship of ourselves? Uh, but throw in dental work, and you can really put icing on that cake. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to blame it all on the dentist. You can have very kindly dentists and just be an asshole to them, uh, like me. And and you go in and you're like hate, and you just hate this poor person who who just wants to help you. And so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> gotta take some responsibility <laughs> there. Yeah, I mean, we just need to like verbalize everything before you go to the dentist that you haven't <laughs> censored out. Verbal diarrhea. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bear wants to know who recently did a dissection with you. Bear. Uh, Bear. Oh yeah, I know Bear. Hey Bear, uh, I hope your baby's happy. <laughs> you know any good anatomy jokes? Yeah. Do I know any good anatomy jokes? I don't know any jokes at all. I seem to have a good time and laugh a lot, but I, I can't remember a single joke. Some people could just stand there and tell jokes all day long. I don't know a joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's <a> good joke. <laughs> what, did, what did the anatomist joke about? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I literally... I. I don't know an anatomy joke. <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so going an anatomist, to that, a cadaver, and a medical student. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're standing what in happened? a ring together. What? Nothing. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> the cadaver sat up on the table and said, deeper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm circling back uh, to Carrie um, and it's going back to um, COVID. Um, and um, she said, some colleagues have been receiving the COVID vaccine and may have affected the people's fascist quality. And she wondered if you had any thoughts on maybe like the COVID vaccine, but maybe vaccines in general and their impact on the tissues of wow, the body. Wow, you're just asking to get me in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the Hello Work community hold, holds love. <laughs> you also do not have to answer that question that you would prefer not to. Yeah, well, let's put it this way. In the most general uh, and, and universally acceptable statement I can make, which is that all, all, without an exception, all um, chemical medical interventions have side effects, right? So we don't, we don't not, you know, <laughs> not use medicine because they have side effects. Although some people literally don't use medicine because they have side effects, but life also has side effects. So you can't really get, get away from side effects. Uh, and sometimes my dad who took all kinds of medications, he had COPD, he had asthma, he lived on a cannula for the last 11 years of his life. And he would look at his medications and read the bottle or look at the insert, he actually would do that. Very few people actually look at the insert, which is probably a good thing because they're fucking terrifying, okay? <laughs> and, and he would say, it looks to me <laughs> like <laughs> if a side effect can be death, then that's more like the main effect. Like, and he would be like, I don't wanna take that medicine. He managed to live to be 75. He outlived his doctor's predictions by about 11 years. And so um, well, let me just put it this way. I don't think we should pretend that vaccines don't have side effects. Um, you know, Pfizer just published a list of, I think it was 1,200. Oh, wow. <laughs> <side effects. laughs> 1,200 side effects. That's a lot of side effects. That's like many, many, many effects. And so it's just to say, I always say to people, I am, I'm a, I'm a free will agent guy. Like I'm like, you want to, whatever you want implants, you want tattoos, you want piercings, you want to staple your stomach. I don't care what you do to yourself. It's we're humans are here to play, you know? And so if that's how you want to play with this gift of your body, then go right ahead. I literally don't care what you do to yourself. <laughs> I, I think it's kind of cool. I want to see, actually. I want you to do something. Just, I want to get to look at it after you die. I, I, it's like my thing, right? So I, I got nothing against it. Absolutely. I do not judge that. Um, and also, I believe in informed consent. Uh, it's the most um, essential groundwork principle of any kind of body work or any kind of therapeutic intervention or any kind of medicine. You have to tell someone what can go on here. You have to share that. And so if you if you are informed, do whatever you want. And also then there will be side effects, whether it's to body work and you're hoping the side effects are good. You know, that's, a, you know, that, right. And, and then, and then you, you have your experience, you know, so, um, so same goes, same goes with, uh, with vaccinations, et cetera. Although I do find, feel that it's incumbent upon the people who produce them and who encourage folks to take them to produce the, uh, the, a full story, you know, a full uh, accounting as full as can be offered. Uh, and, where, and where there is information that, that is um, lacking, that that also be part of the information like, uh, we know about this. We know about this. We don't know about this. You know, so yeah. And then you go and have your experience. 
Yeah, that's one of my favorite stories of of the faculty that they tell about Joseph Heller is a lot of times somebody would ask him a question and he'd be like, I don't know. Good. That's <laughs> that's the sign of a true expert. Right? Yeah. Because I always I always say in the classroom, it's like if you went up to Carl Sagan, like Mr. Mr. Uh, Astrophysics, physicist, astronomer, and said, and just kind of spun him around and pointed him at a white dot in the sky and said, you know, Carl, well, what's that one? He'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And it's the same with anatomy. People are like, what's that, Gil? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of the whole freaking universe is in there. How am I supposed to know? You know, but I can look at it with you. I can get excited about it with you. I can ask the question, but I don't know. Like, I will not have someone help me in my class. Like, I have various, you know, assistants, co-teachers, and folks who have taken over for me now. Actually, I'm, I'm not doing that particular events. And I don't care what they know. I want to know whether they're willing to admit what they don't know. It's so much more valuable for a group of people studying together to not have a faker pontificating and just spinning yarns and bullshit uh, because they feel that's their job. So hats off to Joseph Heller. I met him a couple of times. He's a sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> met him virtually. <laughs> um, so something I am curious about is if you have had a recent aha moment if you uh if you could think of one if you'd be open to share or maybe a question of something you don't know that you're pondering right now have i had a reset moment where i say that again i gotta take that in I if you if you had a recent aha moment aha like moment oh like that's my whole life yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Aha. I don't know jack shit. That's my <laughs> aha. Or, oh my gosh, for the 500th time, I've made the same assumption and been shown up by it. Right? It's amazing how hard it is to root out our dogmas. Uh-huh. Right? And 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 maybe that's the aha is, is like, oh my gosh, I fell for my own lie again and missed reality because I was showing up with my presuppositions, you uh -huh. know? So in the lab that's happened a million times. Like, like you, you think you're over the book idea and that you're approaching like what I said earlier about the client. Like, are you working on who's you know, in front of you rather than the idea inside your head? Well, my clients are on the table too, right? The, the cadavers and I, I have the same problem. And that's why I keep talking about it because I have the same thing. And it's always like, oh my gosh, like for the 5,000th time, I'm, re I'm reminded that this is not a book, you know, <laughs> that this is a person or the record of a person and that it is absolutely unique. And I keep on how many times I go, I, I do peck number one and do the other side, peck number two. And I think it's going to be like number one, but it's not. And then I go to the body at the next table and I do, I do peck number three and thinking, oh, well, now I know about the peck. And this is a simple one, right? Now I know about the peck and I go there and it's not the same. And then I go to number four on the other side of the second body and it's different again. I'm like, is this really possible? <laughs> that is always different, you know? And because it's, how come it will never, how come reality will never stay still for my fixed idea it just it just won't it refuses and and it's it's that's that's maybe my 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 most profound lasting aha uh -huh. is that is that no matter i'm like no matter how many times i think i've learned a lesson <laughs> like aha uh <-huh. laughs> you're still holding on <laughs> uh yeah I feel you there. Um, uh, how do you manage in your classes? Like, how do you set them up? Because you talk about like spontaneity and curiosity. So how do you hold your group in a dissection? And uh, how how do you move through the, the micro to the macro? Because you do a lot of integral mm. work. Wow, yeah, that's that's kind of an art form. We could do a whole, a whole, whole book on that one we could do 
a course. We could do an, a year long um, series on how to create space. And, and that is one of my favorite things really. Um, and for my part, You know, I, I do try and create an environment that invites the whole person to show up and not just some piece of them, not just the intellectual piece that I can shove words into, um, but to, to be like, no, we're, we're whole people studying the whole person. And so I'm not going to ask you to exclude your emotional life. I'm not going to ask you to exclude your prejudices. I'm not going to ask you to exclude anything because if we, if we can't witness the whole and accept it kind of as it is, it's very hard to go from, it's very hard to go from New York to Chicago if you don't know you're in New York, <laughs> right? So if you think you're in Florida <laughs> or if you think you're in Gary, Indiana, and you're going to Chicago, you're going to be really disappointed when you head out and you're actually leaving from New York. So we have to we have to kind of know where we are and accept exactly where we are and where someone else is before we can meet on the road and go somewhere together. So I do start every every workshop I've ever done every the first hour of every morning during the whole workshop, not just one morning, first hour we spend in a conversation you know, in a circle with a candle in the middle of it and maybe some poetry as a way to, to create a community. So there's a lot of community building that creates the possibility of dissecting together. Because if you think you're just going to walk up to the table and everything's just going to happen, uh, it's not. And I, I, I you know, I, I just know from hearing from folks who don't <laughs> do this, you know, by Wednesday, everyone's outside smoking. You can't even stay in the room. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to create the, the, a, a connection between people before they're willing to lean on each other at the table, to share with each other, to inquire together, to share their surprises or to help each other out when something's challenging. So it's, it's a lot about community building and also learning to, extrapolate from the table to the people around you and say, oh, this person on this table who passed away and suffered and has family grieving for them and who went through these various difficult experiences that we're witnessing in their tissues, that's us, that's us too. We haven't expired yet, but it's it, we're all on the same suffering planet. And, and if you can have compassion and love for this, uh, this example on the table, then surely you can look around the room and have compassion and love uh, for, the, for the people who are around you and, and stop blaming the person who you think is annoying for your irritation, uh, <laughs> you know, because I'm constantly calling people to be as adult as possible and to take responsibility for their own experience because Today, the lady with the perfume was pissing you off. Tomorrow, you suddenly love her perfume and, and want to and want to be standing right next to her, you know, because you have more compassion in your heart and, and it's not bothering you anymore. The thing that was bothering you was not about that person. It's about you. 99% of the time, a petty tyrant, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know it's it's your own reactivity that needs to be inspected not them so i love jesus quote take this speck out of your own eye or the plank rather take the plank out of your own eye before you try and remove the speck from someone else's eye so i try and cultivate that kind of culture and it 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 um it, it works that's really beautiful i uh, love that um that was one of the favorite parts of our training with our sharing circles that mm. we also sat in every morning and had some poetry and mm -hmm. <laughs> had some hashing out and ownership and I statement. <laughs> so it could be pretty powerful uh, yeah. uh, bonding. Um, let's see, going back around, uh, Veronica is working with, and this might speak to maybe like a specific how how to look at something specific in the body from a body worker and maybe like maybe you can give the viewpoint of blowing it up but she's 
uh, working with some clients with frozen shoulder and I was okay. trying okay. to understand that better. So uh, what would be your thoughts on frozen shoulder and maybe like where to look elsewhere in the body? Mm. Well, I love shoulders because they can heal, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's so much soft tissue that it's it's it is a place where we can we can work and actually get somewhere uh, and help somebody. And so it's nice to know the tissue relationships, right? Uh, and where it's normal for there to be differential movement, right? So frozen shoulder implies that tissues that would normally express differ differential movement, meaning some tissue can go in one direction and some tissue can go in another direction at the same time because there are sort of pl membranous planes relating them that, that permit movement and that there's muscle fasciculi that aren't all having a charley horse kind of experience. So there's a lot of levels to the actual expression in the tissue of what folks colloquially call frozen shoulder. Like what is frozen shoulder? <laughs> <And> frozen <laughs> shoulder is, is um, generally a combination of, of muscle fasciculi that are on, that don't need to be on, but by virtue of all being on, <laughs> create a kind of a texture and uh, both a texture because of chronic habitual contraction, ischemia and toxicity in the tissues as a result of perpetual holding, right? As well as the change in the membranous tissues in there that are the planes of differential movement all the way down to the spaces between individual muscle cells but all the way out to the big compartments that have names and are famous. So all of those dimension of it can be addressed with your hands, which is really nice, right? But also someone is holding on there for dear life. You know, this is a person, not a bunch of meat. So there's a, there's a reason, right? Why someone's holding on there, which can be protection, or the, the, the idea that you're protecting something that hurts. And so you hold it steady um, or you withdraw probably a little of both. So you hold and withdraw from the area because you're you kind of like, oh, the baby's crying. Well, one way to fix that is to just leave the house and then you won't, <laughs> you won't hear it anymore. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't help the baby, <laughs> right? And that's what we do all over our, our body. Our little pain, our aches and pains are like little crying babies. And instead of comforting them, we, we've run. And so there's multiple levels on the part of someone working with that to basically both invite someone back into the house, even though the baby's crying, you know, and to see, can we live with that for, for enough to give it comfort? because there's no comfort to be had if you're not in the same building, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, I don't know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways to go about that. Um, but I think it's absolutely accessible and resolvable um, and, you, and very satisfying to help someone like that, but it's gotta be so invitations, both at the manual level, hand mono, mono to shoulder, right? Hand to shoulder invitation to be present, but also um, kind of the coaxing of the being um, to, be, to be present. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why they came to you, right? Whether, whether someone knows it or not. I think fix me. Uh, that's a pretty, that's easy. Fix me. I got this thing. But if you can like coax a person into relationship with themselves, mm -hmm. um, then you don't even have to pronounce that scary word responsibility. Um, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, you, you, you just, you just, you know, invite it by like literally creating a community of you, your client and their body. Right. And until it's all recognized to be one, one continuum. We 
you feel like that is is part of the the purpose or drive that you have with your work or what what do you feel like it is for you now has it changed mm. over the years um i think uh yeah i think it's very much a vocation to um that i have to invite people into uh a, a conception and relationship with the human form that's appreciative, right? To kind of steer away from the notion that the body is a problem and steer towards the recognition of the body as a gift. And that, that, that can, uh, and that's the, like to me, the great leveler of all humanity is our embodied status. Um, I don't care who you are or where you are or what your politics are, or what your religion is, what country you're from, what continent, what language you speak, what sex you are or think you are or want to be. <laughs> um, it, we've all got a body and we're all sort of struggling a little bit with them. It's a very rare person who would say, oh, yeah, no, me and my body, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> No problemo, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, well, if we're if we're kind of zoning in on that and exploring that, I'm amazed at how many other things don't ever come up, you know, and how communities form. And I have been working on it for years. Communities form a, a, amongst people of diverse realities, literally, mm -hmm. and I think that's cool. Great. <laughs> I concur. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons I love my work. Mm. Um, I really like holding holding the space and witnessing. Um, but I like that yeah. that that resonance I'm feeling from you of <laughs> creating compassion. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. A little more, a little, a little humility and a lot of compassion go a long way in, in, uh, in lifting up the planet. Um, all right, I'm gonna scan and see, and make sure nobody got left behind. Um, uh, Carrie also asks, in current, in cur is current science recategorizing fascia as part of the nervous system, such as part of interception? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, you know, science, they love their boxes, science, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and putting things in boxes or chapters of books or little bump out boxes in chapters and books. <laughs> and it's really just our made up stuff. So there's reality, and then there's us cutting it up with our scalpels cutting it up with our words, naming, identifying, taxon taxonomy, if eyeing, right? We create these taxonomies and, and then we fight about them. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, attach, we attach to our taxonomies and, and, then we, and then we hold them literally as dogmas, right? As incontrovertible truths that we just made up last week or a hundred years ago, or even a thousand years ago, it doesn't make it any less closer to reality, right? So, um, so there will, oh, there will be people who will be re-taxonomizing fascia and the nervous system. And there will be people who consider, you know, cells to be life and other stuff not to be life, right? Or, or nerves to be important and other things not to be important. And if the things that aren't important, we want to make them important, then we have to associate them somehow with the thing that is important. So, so we can, so if only fascia was a part of the nervous system, <laughs> then everyone would have to admit how important it is. And the fact is that fascia is, has lots of nerves in it. Or maybe Maybe fascia is, why, why is it the neuron? 
that gets the, the high seat at the table and the fascia that surrounds it gets the low seat at the table. What's a, what's a nerve? A nerve is an organ, you know, that's comprised of neurons and, and, and connective tissue, right? Forming fascial sleeves around it or, or glial wrappings, right? Well, we have these ideas of separation, you know, of concepts that are then separated in our minds. But when you look at the tissues, it's just one friggin' big pile of stuff. <laughs> and you can get your you can get your scalpel in between the stuff or you can get your laser beam under the microscope in between the stuff and try and say that's a thing and that's a thing but it never was a thing it's not a thing the thing is the whole and the scalpels and the laser beams and the ideas and the words create separations that aren't real they're just conceptual and and so whether you know the who's whatever science might be including this, that, or the other thing, I'm just going to go, I'm kind of, I'm honestly going to yawn a little bit. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> it's, I, it's like witnessing the birth of a new dogma. Got to be careful, you know, and, and the dot that if there's good, if there should be a dogma, it should be called reality. And, and if there should be idols and false beliefs, they can be called words. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. That are, <laughs> That are applied that are applied to that <laughs> that reality that that one true thing. All right. Well, the last question. And I love I the question. <laughs> <laughs> like, get that man off of his soapbox. Someone light a match underneath that cardboard there. <laughs> Bring him down. Uh, last question I have for you is: Are you taking any anatomical dance requests? <laughs> no <laughs> but what was it um i was just gonna start listing off probably organs and go from there but let's do the gallbladder the gallbladder yeah, yeah the gallbladder so here we go okay <laughs> oh so you're the okay. gallbladder now right Here's the gallbladder, right? And and okay, I hear the pizza's coming. The big <laughs> wad of cheese from the deep dish pizza is coming. And you have to go. And this is peristalsis going through the gallbladder. And then look, and then you go like this, like a hose, and you squirt. Like squirting to put out the cheese fire. <laughs> I would have done that more elegantly, but I have a rib out at the moment. I could barely stand up. So, if I was more technically savvy, I'd put some I'd put some background music in there for the recording. But <laughs> you'll just have to make it up on their own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gil, this was so lovely. Uh, thank you so so much for getting back to me and sharing with the community and. Uh, I just, I find it really inspirational how curious you are and your passion for education and teaching people. I love your website and all that you offer and how you keep bumping up on every interest I have. So I think I'm, I'm going to be guided to doing a dissection and I think I'm on that path. So thank you so much. Thank you, Greer. It's been a pleasure. You're lots of fun, and I love the Hello Work community, and uh, blow it kisses. Thank you, girl. <laughs>